Hello everyone, today is Thursday, September 19, 2019. This is the week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. And believe me, I know you probably have a busy schedule if you're anything like me. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I quite often sum it up, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. We've got a lot to talk about here, obviously. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them somewhat relative to what we're talking about, and that way my ADD won't kick in. Your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the charts for that. And also, if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time, also for your benefit. That way I know which ones I could and which ones I did not. So... Today I want to talk about peeling the trading psychology onion, the journey to successful trading. Over the weekend I was in San Francisco and I talked a lot about trading psychology. Obviously everyone there in the TSAASF, which is a technical analysis association, actually the oldest one in the United States, which I did not know. I think next year is going to be their 60th anniversary, something crazy like that. And while there, I talked a lot about trading psychology, and I began to use the phrase like peeling the onion. And it really is. The more you learn about it, the more you learn about yourself, and the more you learn about why you feel the way you feel. And it's a, it's a great thing. You just learn more and more and more, and you feel more and more normal in your trading. Now, trading never really becomes easy, but it does become somewhat easier. And when you do screw up, you know you screwed up. You know why you screwed up. And then you take steps to don't do the same thing again. Now, one of the attendees there sent me this email last night and said, what is the 90% battle? Well, I guess she's referring to the battle that's within. Trading is 90% trading psychology, and the other 50% is the methodology. And I guess the other 50% would also be money management, to make a little yogiism there. So how am I supposed to win over myself? Is that like Zen trading? Have you heard of that? I know they say it's a game when it comes to psychology, but I never really mastered it. I still do not know how to stay bored, et cetera, disinterested when I am losing my account. Indeed, it is unnatural. I can hear my poor mother still yelling at me for going into these webinars and seminars. Thoughts on these? Thank you, Jennifer. Well, what I'm going to recommend Jennifer do, because she does have access to the members area, is to take the trading psychology course, the mindset course there, which I think will answer nearly all of these questions. And what I'm also going to do next Wednesday is I'm going to deconstruct this email a little bit and see how many answers or at least how many pointers I can point to that will answer these questions. Now, today, what I thought it'd be good to do is get to that trading psychology onion to build the base so Jennifer and anyone else who may be struggling, like we all do pretty much all the time, right, can take it one step further. So let's take a step back first and peel the onion on trading psychology. When we first get started, we think, wow, this trading thing looks pretty darn easy but we soon find out that maybe it's not that easy it's actually hard and you begin to feel i guess lonely for lack of a better word you feel like there's something wrong with you and then as you begin to stop chasing the holy grail and start studying a little trading psychology you quickly realize that we're not made to trade and this is from both a psychological level and even on a physiological level, there's some neurology involved. And the neurology journey is something that I don't, I've only begun to explore. And I really thought it was just a few years, but it's actually seven years ago, I think, is when I really started getting into the neurology of it all. And then all this leads to a self-discovery. And through that, you become very cognizant of your bad behaviors and then you're like, well, I'm going to either have to fix what I'm doing. And in some cases, it can take drastic steps. But most of the time, the good news is it can be very little small steps. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But once you become cognizant, then you can start committing to those commitment devices. 
And then you reach a point where you begin doing brutally honest, process-oriented post-mortems. And that's probably the hardest thing. I have a hard time. Now, if it's a winning trade, hey, no problem. But when I lose my ass on something, I really don't want to go back in and look at what I did wrong, if anything. And that's the tricky part is because you know you need to be process oriented and postmortems, and we'll get to that towards the end of this presentation. But to my surprise, and this is one reason I love to teach, it's like I never know what's going to strike a chord with someone. I never know what really needs to be fleshed out. And postmortems is one of those things. Uh, repeatability is another one of those things, too. I often talk, not to get sidetracked, but I talked about that yesterday at the presentation for StockCharts.com on Market Watchers Live with David Keller, which you can find now on YouTube, FYI, on the channel. I'd recommend you subscribe to their channel. Subscribe to my channel, too, and I'll like the videos that I'm in and other videos that are from those guys. So you'll, that's another way of getting them. But anyway, long story endless, I mentioned repeatability, and that seemed to strike a card with many people several years ago. And then that's something that David Keller wanted me to flesh out a little bit yesterday, too. And repeatability is just the ability to repeat the performance to repeat the methodology through following the process. So a lot of these things I don't really think about too much, but then when I get out there a little bit, either through the internet with somebody else other than my own little show here, or physically going to San Francisco or flying across the pond or wherever, I get to interact with a lot of people and realize what's what's needed and then where people might be searching a little bit and what are those holes that need to be filled in. So let's break all this down. So when you first get started, trading seems pretty easy. You're like, okay, well, let's just buy with these trends and it looks pretty darn easy. Look at all these great trends. Wow, I could have gotten in here and gotten out there and I could have made a fortune. And you might even start thinking about all the stuff you can buy with that money. But then the reality soon becomes, well, wait a minute, this trading thing is actually pretty hard. I mean, all I have to do is capture some little blips on the screen, but when I try to do it, what happens? Well, it's a heck of a lot harder than it looked at first. So you reach a point where it's you begin to learn that this trading thing feels unnatural. And you don't know it at the time, but you're really hard on yourself because, wait a minute, I'm a successful doctor or a lawyer or automatic transmission mechanic. I should be able to master this trading thing. I'm just trying to catch a little blip on the screen. That's it. But the reality is it's especially hard for you. It's especially hard for the successful. Now, I used to ask the question over and over and over in webinars, like, why is it that these same people who strive for perfection in life, who work hard at getting better and all these other great things that make them successful, why do they settle for such mediocrity and markets? I sit here until I'm blue in the face, and some days like today, I push the button on my stand-up desk and I stand here. And I say, pick the best and leave the rest. Make sure the stock is trending. Make sure it's accelerating higher. Ideally, make sure it's persisting. Or if you're trading an emerging trend pattern, make darn sure that it truly is emerging into a new trend and that you're not picking the bottom or picking the top. Make sure, at the least, the stock does not look like an electrocardiogram. Well, I thought about this and thought about this, and I kept bringing this up, like, why are these people picking these crappy stocks? And then Dr. J, who's a psychiatrist, was kind enough to send me several paragraphs on why she thought this was. And just to kind of sum it up, because, because we don't have enough time to get into the, the, the weeds on all this, but just to sum it up, she basically said that if you're a doctor, a lawyer, or an automatic transmission mechanic, you can't sit around and wait for the perfect client, the client you know that you could easily fix, the client that you know will be a win, you have to take whatever, and she used the word train wreck, which I thought was a beautiful way of saying it, that comes along. 
And then she finished it by saying, we have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of the mindset. So if you think about that, whatever you're successful, whatever field you're successful in, you must take whatever train wreck comes along. You have to work. You have to do what you do in order to get paid. And trading a lot of times, there's nothing to do. As I often preach, trading done properly can be quite boring. And as I kind of joked yesterday or day before, whatever, uh, I think it was Monday, trading is like sailing. Hours of boredom interrupted by brief moments of sheer panic. But before I forget, or before I digress too far, the point is that you really have to pick the best to leave the rest, and you might sit around for a long, long time. Last night, for reference, today is September 19th, 2019. That last night, I have about 30 stocks in my Landry list. Now, I'm not going to try to trade all 30. I think that would be kind of ludicrous. But I just wanted to show everybody what I'm seeing. I'm seeing quite a few software stocks as potential shorts, a few health services as potential shorts, an IPO that I'm thinking about maybe by the end of today, and possibly some gold and silvers that could be on the cusp of rolling over. But so far, it looks like they might still have a chance of heading higher. And the point is that I've got 30 stocks that I'm looking at for today. But just a couple of months ago, when the market was really just chopping around and not starting to move around and the volatility hadn't come back in like we're seeing now, I didn't have any. And that's that's kind of a rarity where I don't have any whatsoever. But I there were a couple of nights, maybe even more than a couple of nights, where I didn't have any stocks to show my peeps that I was going to trade or think about trade or just want to keep an eye on in my Landry list. And then now we have like 30. So a lot of times you might have to sit around and sit in your hands. And I remember going from like zero to maybe one or two or three potential setups. And then now we have quite a few to look at. Now, another biggie, especially for the engineers out there and the doctors, but it also applies to automatic transmission mechanics and many other professions, is that failure is just simply not an option. As I often joke, if you're an engineer and half your bridges fall down, or let's just say one of your bridges falls down, you're not going to be an engineer for long. And if you kill half your patients, especially in non-life-threatening type of surgeries, you're not going to be a doctor for very long. Now, as you learn these things, such as you're going to be wrong a lot, you just have to live with it, you'll also begin to learn some of these other things, like we have a time inconsistency. We're more likely to take certain actions now as opposed to waiting for them in the future. Bottom line is, because of this time inconsistency, our someday goals, somewhere out in the future, somewhat esoteric, way out there, and we all believe we're going to get there, otherwise why bother, but these someday goals are hijacked by what's happening now. Now, dieting is a really good example of that. I seem to be often on a diet for most of my adult life, and you often succumb to these short-term temptations. Eating that cheeseburger and fries won't hurt, right? Or skipping today's workout really won't make a difference. But longer term, obviously, these bad behaviors, especially if they create bad habits, which they will, will begin to really hurt you and keep you from ever achieving that longer term goal. So if we take a look at trading, well, breaking the trading plan just this once isn't that big of a deal. Okay, this stock is really going against me. It just blew through my stop, but it's so oversold. What if I just hang on and hang on a little bit longer and maybe see if it comes back by the end of the day? Well, this opening gap reversal, I'm down sharply in this thing, but it's so oversold. Instead of having that be a day trade, let me just hold overnight, see what happens. And this is just human nature, and there's actually 
something that explains it. There's actually a term for it. It's called acrasia. It's something I've talked about quite often. It's a state of mind in which someone acts against their better judgment through the weakness of will. We're all guilty of this. I had some mistakes earlier this week based on this concept here. So as we begin to understand the psychology, if we dig a little deeper or peel the onion a little further, we learn that there is a physiology to it. We learn that we're not made to trade from a physiological standpoint. Now for me, this was huge. It made me realize that just the psychology yeah, okay, psychologically we're not made to trade, whatever, I get that, I understand that. But if there's a neurology involved, that's taking it to one step higher. And I think where I'm going with this is the psychology, even though the psychology you know is, is against you, it's kind of hard because the psychology can be a little bit out there and kind of hard to wrap your head, your head around, but the neurology is more of an exact science for the most part all of our brains work pretty much in the same fashion so for me that was a bit of a, an epiphany when i began to understand just a tiny bit of neurology you don't have to be a brain surgeon believe me to understand what little neurology you need to know for trading and one of those big epiphanies was that the lower level brain, the limbic system, which creates most of your emotions, which most of which derive from your amygdala, is responsible for the perception of emotions such as anger, fear, and sadness. And I like this definition because it uses the word perception. And by looking at it like that, it's what you perceive, I think you can change your perceptions. Now, the thing about it is this little bitty part of your brain can often control the rest of what's sloshing around up there. Now, I've done extended presentations on the lower level brain and all these other things, but the bottom line is if you learn to embrace that this amygdala, which is very efficient, but not very smart and very emotional, can really screw you up and learn to embrace that and learn to sort of hijack your brain to use the rest of what's sloshing around up there. That's one of the big epiphanies for me and I think it will be for you to improve your trading performance. And there's a couple examples here. Greg Morris, as I've said before, in the flight simulators, when they try to get the pilots to flunk out of flight school, they, they obviously want the best pilots they can. They want the ones with the ice in their veins. But what they do is they try to trip them up by putting a bunch of indicator lights on and everything, and they try to get the pilots who crash the simulator and thereby crash out of flight school. And he was not immune to the problems that come from the panic and the emotions of this lower level brain. Even though you're in a flight simulator, you're not gonna die, there's still a lot of emotions that happen. And he began to worry that he was gonna flunk out of flight school. Now it ended well for him. He became a Top Gun pilot, an airline pilot, and then a trader running billions of dollars. As Greg says, well, he also started a website that, that became worth millions too and sold it to stockcharts.com, by the way. But anyway, he did all that. And, and as he often jokes, sounds like a guy who can't keep a job. But the point is, He's highly successful, but a lot of his success may not have ever come had he not learned to control this lower part of his brain. And I guess control is a, 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 the wrong word. You have to figure out a way to sort of bypass these lower level primal urges from that lower level primal brain. And some of the simplest things is just counting to three, taking a deep breath, and let the rest of your brain begin to work. So in Greg's case, he would wind a clock. His F4 simulators, they had an analog clock, so when the shit hit the fan, he'd reach down, he'd wind a clock, and that would give him time to think in a logical manner and use the rest of what's sloshing around there 
to make sure he was doing the right decision. I, once I get all my trade loaded up and right before it says confirm and send, I count to three. I actually did buy me a little airline, uh, vintage airline clock, which I keep on my desk and I pick it up and I, I wind a clock a little bit. And that stops me for one second to, from making a possible emotionally charged decision. Now, continuing along the lines, the neurology, I didn't know until seven years ago that you can't make a decision, and that's any decision, even what you will have for lunch today without emotions and stress. Denise Scholl was talking at the TSAASF conference, and this is, she talked about this, and then I later did a little reading from a guy called Damasio. And the point is that you have emotions in every decision, even what you're going to have for lunch today. If you, you married guys know it's like a lot of emotions go into every night's dinner decision, right? But you can't make that decision unless there is some emotion, unless one decision has a consequence over the other. And as I often say, those who have had illness or injury to the parts of their brain that make the decision, those emotional parts, I should say, of their brain, where decisions tend to arise and have that consequence, can no longer make a decision. And that's any decision because one decision doesn't have a consequence over the other. So decisions come with emotions and stress. Once you learn that, then you can learn how to make fewer decisions, or as I'll show you in one second, how to let the market make decisions for you. So in the process of all this trading psychology and learning a little bit about neurology becomes a point where epiphanies begin to emerge, becomes a little bit of a self-discovery. And you begin to say, well, wait a minute. I just learned through Demacio or Shaw or from Dave talking about these guys all the time, guys and girls, that I'm emotional just like everyone else. And everybody else is emotional in the market. And that's epiphany makes you realize that you're normal in all this. And if you think about it, my definition of technical analysis is, and it's not that technical, is reading the emotions of the market's participants, and that's through charts, obviously. If I see a big sideways range and the market's right below it, I know that market's going to have trouble getting through that sideways range. Why? Because that's some sort of crazy, technical, stochastic, whatever, blah, 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 to get through? No, it's because there was trading in that range, and a lot of people likely have bought the stock or any other market in that range, and they're likely to look to get out at break-even should it hit that range. So there's no mumbo-jumbo or anything complex about the technical analysis one-on-one. -on -one. Now, once you read the emotions of the market participants and decide how you're going to act, you have to embrace your own emotions, not eliminate them because that's impossible. And I think that's what Jennifer was suggesting, some kind of way to eliminate emotions. And that simply is not possible. Now, if you think about it, the reason that technical analysis does work is because market participants often behave in an irrational manner. Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. If markets were perfect, they would not exist. There wouldn't be a market. And all of this makes you realize that the urges of others is what makes you profitable, provided, of course, if you're willing to embrace your own emotions. So when I get stressed out on markets or when they're not doing what I want them to do and I feel myself getting a little emotional, I just remind myself, it's like, yeah, this sucks right now, but embrace how I'm feeling and what the market's doing and recognize that. And then the next, next time you see that pattern, especially if I'm not an active participant, that my feelings or a microcosm of what's likely out there and 
others are likely feeling that and how, you know, it's going to sound a little bizarre, but how can I take advantage of their predicament? And that's what we do for the charts. Now, it's been a few years, but I was in Vegas talking to a group of day traders and somebody reminded me that we're trading traders and not markets. And that's true. And I'm always talking about there's people behind those little blips on the screen. There's people behind those bars. And it's not just a little bar in and of itself. It represents trading, trading by people. And even if it's some sort of mechanical computer or whatever doing that trading, then somebody had to program that, that computer or whatever, and somebody had to make that happen. And somebody has to monitor that performance and so on and so forth. Now, one of my big epiphanies throughout the years is that the wise eventually become wise. The wise, W-H-Y-S, eventually becomes wise, W-I. S E and so it's like okay well wait a minute I now know a little neurology and now know we can't eliminate our emotions and now I know a little psychology we have this time and consistency thing the bottom line there is a short term temptation can also often screw up your longer term goals and then for me as I've said quite often I took a personality test a few years back and I scored extremely low in modesty or zero in modesty which means I have a bit of an ego Okay, and I scored very low in the category overall of agreeableness. So those are two of the possibly worst traits you could ever have as a trader. So all of a sudden I realized, well, wait a minute, I'm not agreeable. I thought I was the most agreeable guy on the planet. Don't you agree? Well, as I've said before, I told this to my wife and kids. And they looked at me like I pooed in my pants, kind of look they give you in Starbucks when you walk in there and just ask for a cup of coffee. I've done that years ago, many, many years ago, before I had a teenager teach me how to order. Now, once you become cognizant of your bad behaviors, you're able to ask yourself, especially when you're tempted to do the wrong thing, are you becoming, are you going toward or away from your goal? If you're not honoring your stop, then obviously you're going away from your goal. If you're micromanaging by exiting the position for a small loss, when it's nowhere near your stop, then you're not moving toward your goal. When you look at a lot of the stocks that I recommend, a lot of times they trigger and then flatline and sometimes even come back in and go negative for a while. And not just on the short side, but especially on the short side, for instance, we're short TSCO, tractor supply. And as soon as this thing triggered, it immediately started going the opposite way. And that happened for a few days. As an old Wall Street adage, all shorts go against you. Well, it just seems like with me, more often than not, all positions go against me at least at first now there's a few exceptions to the norm or uhn last week rallied i think 60 percent or thereabouts right around the trip right after it triggered and that happened in, in a few hours but that's the exception not the norm anyway the point there is if you were to micromanage yourself out of positions because they were going against you a little bit you would never catch a big winner if you were to sharpshoot your signals that you know you should take, okay, I'm not saying try to trade all 30 stocks in the Landry list, but you pick, but if I pick one or two of those and you decide that you're following along with everything, but you know what, you're just gonna, you're gonna pick your own or wait or whatever and sharpshoot the signals, then you're, you're moving away from your goal. Not that I'm the be all end all, but I'm just saying that. You decide to get into something that you need to follow through with your plan and not sharpshoot certain signals. And that's usually the biggest problem I see when somebody's trying to follow along directly is that I'll say, okay, they're like, Dave, I can't make any money. He's like, all right, well, did you take that one that went up 60% last week? No. It's like, okay. Well, did you take this one that went up? Not a lot, but we got a little swing trade out. No, it's like, well, I took those other stinkers you recommended. So that's another 
one of those little problems. And the bottom line is micromanagement of your trades is going to be your biggest problem here. And a lot of times you mentally monetize. And if you start mentally monetizing that trade, and it's a good problem to have, but it's a bad problem because you end up taking those profits and then you watch in anguish as the market takes off without you. Now, once you become cognizant of all of these bad behaviors through studying a little bit of psychology, through studying a little bit of neurology and all of this self-discovery and beginning to embrace your emotions and understand that we're just not made to trade, then you can start committing to commitment devices. And that could be something as simple as taking a breath, turning off your screens, or as we'll see in just one second, some more drastic action. So the rage a while back, and I guess still is on the internet, is all these little hacks, which I think are pretty cool and a lot of fun. So let's talk about hacking some of these psychological problems. If you're micromanaging your trade, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just turn off your screens. And if you find yourself trading in less than ideal conditions, find something to do that's far more interesting. I guarantee you, if I sit and watch a screen, I'm going to place unnecessary trades. Now, let's say you're a little hesitant to get into a trade. Well, what you could do is use a stop entry order. And that'll save your butt especially when you have a stock that takes off. Last Thursday, I nearly missed the what could turn into the biggest winner of the year. I don't know. We'll just see. But it was a, certainly the biggest winner of last week. And I nearly missed it because I put in an order and nothing happened. The next day, I put in an order and nothing happened. Put in an order and nothing happened. Put in an order and nothing happened. That was four or five days in a row. And... On the next day, I'm thinking, eh, why even bother? This thing's not going to trigger. But I'm going to watch it just in case. And then before you know it, this thing begins a rally. And I had to hurry up and get in. But if you just put it in a stop entry order after the open and it doesn't trigger, let's say right around the open, you don't have to take any discretionary moves or anything on it, then put a stop entry order and go about your life. Now, let's say you're hanging on to losers and hoping they come back. Well, one thing you could do is use a hard stop and turn off your screen so it doesn't stress you out any further. Now, where I'm going with this is let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. We're only wired to make so many decisions, and that's why there's a really high burnout rate in air traffic controllers, inner city ER doctors, and day traders because they're making too many decisions in the heat of battle. Now, if you're obsessing over open losses, now I'm not saying throw caution to the wind and let all your positions blow past your stops. What I'm talking about is you have several positions on or even one or two that are going against you and it's really aggravating you because every time you look at the screen, it seems to be getting worse and worse. Well, the solution to that is to have a hard stop in place, of course, and then go for a walk. Or as I often say, I used to live out in the middle of the country about a year, well, we moved about, I guess, six months ago, maybe eight months ago. And now we're back to the city. And then next week we move, by the way, no week of charts next week because I'll be moving. But we're getting ready to move into our new house, new office. But back at the old place, long story endless, it was about two miles around the block. And if I find myself cussing and fussing and screaming at, screaming at my screens when there wasn't anything new to do, but I was just sitting there watching all my positions a road away, it pissed me off, I would go for a walk. And I'd come back all sweaty and frustrated. And then I'd look at the screen. It's like, oh, wow, everything turned around while I was on the walk. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. But to my surprise, many times it has and all those negative, unnecessary emotions could have simply been avoided by not watching the screen or going for more walks. Now, as I hinted about earlier, sometimes we tend to monetize open gains. And by that, I'm just saying, okay, I'm up whatever the amount. I could pay off a credit card with that, or I could pay off my car with that, or I could buy a car with that, whatever. 
as soon as you start doing that, then it becomes really dangerous because you begin thinking about what to do with that money or what that money could do as opposed to just letting the position work. And the secret to trading is, what did Drucker Miller say, preservation of capital and home runs. And you're going to have to have some of those occasional home runs to pay for all this. Otherwise, I can all but guarantee you it's not going to work. And it's a good problem to have, but a lot of times people will monetize those open gains before you know it, they're locking them in. And then, of course, the market really begins to skyrocket higher. So one of the things you could do to help from stop doing that is to make fewer observations and just realize that this is your trading account. You're not going to take the money out to take care of some want or need at least not on an individual trade basis. Now, let's say you're over trading, which we all can be a little guilty of here and there. That's one of the dangers, and I was talking with one of my clients yesterday, and he's guilty of over trading and day trading and doing things that he shouldn't do. And we were sort of talking a little bit about, and he kind of hinted that it's a bit of a slippery slope, but it is. I love trading these opening gap reversals, but I got to be really, really, really careful not to try to do that every day. If I wait days, weeks, and sometimes maybe a month for a really good opening gap reversal, there's no guarantee, obviously, but I almost know I'm going to make money on it. But if I do really well on a couple of them, and next thing you know, it's like, well, I want to do this every day. This is great. Do this every day, make a half percent, percent of my account extra money this is fun it's almost like income which we know does not exist from trading okay at least at least not longer term due to the risk reward but before I digress too far the more you trade the bigger the danger of over trading so what i like to do is keep myself crazy busy and i'll give you a case in point yesterday it's like well yesterday i had some options position on the position on tseo and it's like, okay, well, what would happen? What would be a great profit on these things? And I looked at everything and I said, okay, if I doubled my money on these options plus a little bit more, it would pay for my entire position and it would set me up for continued gains and everything else. And I thought to myself, the chances of that happening today are probably slim and none and slim just left town. But it's like, you know what, let me put those orders in. Now, once I was up, let's say I was watching the screen, and all of a sudden it's like, well, look at that, I'm up five bucks. And I might have even quit before five bucks. I might have said, you know what, five bucks would be great, but this thing's already going three bucks. Maybe I should just lock that in and be happy with that. But instead, I put in some orders, and I had a appearance, I had an appearance, on Market Watchers Live for StockCharts.com with David Keller. And while I was in the show, those orders got triggered and I got the money that I was looking for out of the position and I was able to still have some of the position on just in case the stock continued to run. And it actually came up during the show because he actually brought the stock up. We started talking about it. Had those orders not been in place, I guarantee you I'd have been tempted to possibly do some bad behavior. So I know myself, and it, this whole journey is getting to know yourself. And then one of the biggest things was taking that personality test. That's a pretty easy way to get to know yourself because we think we know ourselves, but we don't. And that personality test suggests that I'm a Mr. Know-it-all, which I know I'm a little bit like that, I'm a little guilty of that. And I'm completely not agreeable. Well, since then, when an argument comes up, I think to myself, okay, I know I'm right, but there's probably a chance, the small chance, of course, but there's probably a chance that I could be wrong. And I found that in many cases, I am wrong. And that's, that's something that I had to wrap my head around. But now that I know myself a little better, I can take some steps to protect myself 
from myself. Now, in here, I said, keep yourself crazy busy or take more drastic steps. And as I've told the story ad nauseum, the client of mine that was doing day trading on the side, which has nothing to do with my methodology, and was losing quite a bit of money doing the day trading, he realized that this was detrimental to his trading account and it wasn't getting him anywhere and was kind of hurting him on a psyche type of level, okay, on a psychological level, it was putting him in a bad mood. And what he finally decided to do was move his money over to a wealth management firm where he would actually have to call his trades in. And to quote him, he didn't want to look like a lunatic. So now he's still doing trades where he's fairly active, but he's only making a few phone calls a week and he's certainly not calling in 50 orders a day. So the bottom line is you often know what you're doing wrong. You're just going to have to take steps to not do that. Now, I think the, the real learning comes when you get to the point of the brutally honest process oriented postmortems. And I mentioned, like I said, postmortems in passing when I was in San Francisco giving the speech. And then afterwards, a lot of people noodled me on that to my surprise. And then and David Keller's show yesterday, he told me that this is something that he really wants to flesh out a lot more. Now, the bottom line is, and somebody reminded me, it's like, I've been doing this for a long time. So what's obvious to me might not be obvious to everyone else. And the point I'm making is that if you're picking the best and leaving the rest, if you truly know your methodology, when you back that chart out and look to your pre-trade trade, pretending that you, you have to tr sort of time travel back in time and forget about the outcome for a second and look at the chart and pretend that you're just seeing, seeing it for the first time. And if you look at the chart and think, man, that looks fantastic, then you did the right thing regardless of the outcome. And a couple things you can ask yourself. Did you really pick the best? Well, if you know your methodology, if you studied the methodology for years and years and years and looked at thousands of charts a day for years and years and years, then you should reach a point where you know what the best that setups are and you know what the worst setups are and you know whether or not you should have taken that setup. Or I should say you know what a bad setup looks like. Now, ask yourself, were conditions really conducive? And as I preach ad nauseum, Sometimes you just have to look at the chart and look at the net net price change. Well, if the S and P's at I don't know, just pull a number out there, twenty nine hundred today, and you look back a month or two or three or a year, and it was at twenty nine hundred, and it just kind of oscillated back and forth between or through the twenty nine hundred, then maybe conditions aren't conducive. If the sector is not trending, if stocks within the sector aren't trending. If you're not seeing a whole lot of setups or sexy brothers or sexy sisters, it depends on what you're into. If you're not seeing a whole bunch of those within the sec sector that you're trading, then maybe it's not that great of a setup. Now, if you still really, 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 really like the setup, then you have to ask yourself, do you really think you have the mother of all setups that can move in spite of the overall market not being an ideal or it's never going to be ideal, but you know what I'm saying. It's better the, in spite of the overall market not trending or in spite of the sector not trending and in spite of individual stocks within the sector not trending and all these things I preach about. But if you really, really like the setup, then by all means, you should have taken it and that's okay. Now, the bottom line is I have process in here quite a few times and it should be it's sort of like the location 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 is to real estate it's process 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 is to trading in fact i think that if i could just give somebody a crappy system or somebody had a crappy system and they followed it to a t i would say well that person can trade okay as opposed to somebody who might develop a great system and not follow it I'd almost rather have, or I'd much rather have, the guy who followed the crappy system because now all he has to do is do some postmortems and tweak his system. He's got the process figured out. Now, if you followed your plan, then you need to pat yourself on the back regardless of the outcome because, because that's a longer term secret to success. Now, let's say you didn't follow your plan. Well, ask yourself why. Now, the problem. Here is if the outcome was positive, again, outcomes are noisy, as Terrence O'Dean once said, 
Bad trades can produce good outcomes, and good trades can produce bad outcomes. So as Andy Duke talks a lot about, you have to learn how to separate that luck from skill. And that's probably, I know I say there's no secret to trading, and then I tell you a secret. Well, that's one of the huge secrets to trading. And she wrote about this in Thinking in Bets. If you go to www.daylander.com slash books dash two dash read, you can get her book there. Now, again, so if you have a positive outcome to a negative or bad trade, something that you should not have taken, then you have to recognize the market has just taught you to trade badly. And one thing I'm noodling with here is if I do some really bad, if I really if I have some bad trading behaviors and I make a lot of money doing it, I need to force myself to do something with that money. And I'm just thinking, like, well, I'll give it to charity, but that kind of gives me a little bit of a reward for bad behavior. So I need to think about something that I can do or some sort of commitment device, or, or I should say some sort of commitment with that that will stop me from doing it again. So like I told Jennifer, go ahead and take the mindset course which we go into a lot more details and all of this stuff and help to peel that onion. And then if you're still having a lot of trouble, we can flesh things out a little further. And by the way, as I'm looking at my courses here, keep in mind that you can't separate your trading psychology from the money management and the methodology. And that's why I came up with the holistic trader course. So after the mindset course, go through money management and methodology, and then the holistic trader sort of pulls it all together. There's a psychology in the money management. For instance, people say, hey, Dave, is your, is your money management psychologically based or statistically based? And my answer to that is yes. We trade for a small short-term short gain. That makes us feel good. That gives us that, as the microwave society has trained us, that instant gratitude that we're looking for. And then we hang on to a piece for a possible longer term move. And that's where the real money is. And that's not to go all freshman psychology on you or whatever, but that's like climbing that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, getting further and further to that self actualization, self realization, et cetera, towards the top of that Maslow's ladder. And from a statistical standpoint, the real money is in the longer term trades. So is the risk, and so is the drawdowns. By taking those partial profits, you keep the lights on just in case that longer term trade doesn't materialize. By keeping a piece on, you are able to participate in that longer term trend if it does materialize, and that's where you're gonna make a lot of money long term. So anyway, money management, psychology, and methodology, all three are intertwined. I still have, we still have quite a few of you who have not joined the Facebook group that are members of DaveLander.com, so make sure you do that. You have to be a gold member to be in the Facebook group. The group is free, but you have to be a member of DaveLander.com. All right, let's go to the live charts. You guys want to start asking about individual issues while I shift gears here. Feel free to do so. I'm just going to take a few minutes and go through some things that I want to show you. And then we'll open it up again for individual questions. Okay, let's take a look at the P's. And then we'll take a look at the other indices and then drill down to some sectors. And I'll be happy to look at any individual stocks that you might want to take a look at. All right, S&P 500. Not a bad day at all, okay? Well, well Dave, it's only up 30%. Yeah, but... Let's look at how close we are to all-time highs. We're eh, round numbers a quarter percent away from all-time highs. Now, for me to get excited about this market, it's going to have to break out to all-time highs, number one. And number two, it's going to have to stay there for a while. Because as you can see, we were just talking about the net-net movement. You can see the market really hasn't moved a whole lot in quite a while. In fact, you erased you erase the last couple of days gains and we're pretty much where we were back in April. And then you can go way back in time and say, well, we're pretty much where we were last fall. So almost one year of no forward progress. Yes, we've had some zigs and zags in between, quite a hard sell off and quite a hard recovery. 
but on a net net basis, we haven't gone anywhere in a long, long while, looking back at least a year. But it's improving as of late. You know, what have you done for me lately? As Janet once said, we're just shy of all time highs. Maybe we'll hit those this afternoon. Maybe we'll close at all time highs. Who knows? My big concern is that we are a little bit overbought in here because we had a pretty good run back to the old highs. And we are now going to bump up against a little bit of resistance. So follow through, stop if you heard that before, as usual, is key. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ's up about a half a percent. I suppose that's nothing to sneeze at. But as I just said a few minutes ago, let's take a look at the net net price movement. Let's go back to the beginning of summer. And we're up 0.69%. Well, we're up a half percent today. So just yesterday, we were flat for several months in here. So the net net pretty much sideways, as you can see. But in general, improving as of late and just shy of all time highs. I don't want to get crazy bearish when a market is hovering around all-time highs. In fact, that's how I developed the TFM 10% system, an objective tool, which is an objective tool to keep me long or mostly long or certainly not getting too bullish as long as the market is at or near its all-time highs. And I've talked about that system and nauseam in the weekend charts, and there's plenty of... YouTube's on that out there. And if you can't find all that, take the free market timing course under the members area, which you don't have to be a member to take. And you'll know as much as I do about that system. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty up a little bit today, not much to write home about. Still has a mountain of overhead supply, or I should say, just a lot of resistance. I don't know if I'd call it overhead supply, but you can see that it's just had a hard time getting past this retrace in here. So for me, it's a little bit cleaner on a weekly. But for me, I really can't get that excited about the Russell as long as it's below, as long as it's below this big picture retrace in here. In shorter term, you can see a lot of little peaks to overcome, but you know routine one day at a time. Some of you've heard that before. The energies were off to the races just a couple days ago because we were not gonna have any oil ever. And then we've already come right back in significantly from that pop higher. Now, I wouldn't count, I wouldn't count the energies out just yet, but we could see some setups here. Now they're pulling back a little bit, so we just have to keep an eye on that sector. I've been bullish on gold and silver for quite a while. My only concern here is that these pullbacks in these areas are beginning to look a little deep and a little questionable. Take silver, for instance, the net net price change has slowed down a little bit. And so far, the big blue arrow is still pointing higher, but the smaller sideways arrow is pointing sideways. But I still think they have one push higher. On your stops just in case and make sure you wait for new interest. John says D Dog just opened $20, $40 higher. D Dog. I don't have that one yet. D D O G. What's the um, what's the actual company on that? That's an IPO. IPO, okay. I'll have to pull it up on another screen, which I have to walk across the room for, but we'll check it out. I wouldn't do anything with that until at least day five expel and we'll come back to that so what else is happening in here okay well i've been somewhat bearish on software because i've been seeing a plethora of, of setups and i find the individual issues look a lot worse or look worse more worse i should say than the overall sector uh not to go too crazy with the classical technical analysis i don't think you can trade off a classical technical analysis but i think it's a good thing to keep an eye on and in this particular case we have a head and shoulders top now if we continue to rally over the next few days maybe we'll take out that top and everything will be fine for now i would be a little cautious and the fact that i'm seeing a plethora of, of setups in software to the short side suggests to me that software has topped and we might be able to get some catch some opportunities there but only only on entries 
The semiconductors are kind of an electrocardiogram, but on a shorter term basis, they have worked their way back towards their prior highs in here. You know me. They're going to have to break out and stay there for a while before I can get too excited about the semis. Health services, another one of those areas. The overall sector doesn't look exactly horrible, but I am seeing some individual issues here that look like they have promise on the short side. So at the moment, I only kind of like the gold and silver on the long side, and maybe not for long. And then on the short side, health services and software. There are some areas like real estate that are doing okay in here. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about the REITs simply because they don't move around enough. Now, there's a few more volatile ones that are at low levels that might be worth a shot with emerging trends. But for the most part, I'm not seeing a whole lot to get excited about there. I think that's about it for the, the sector action. The bottom line is with the market sideways, somewhat longer term and very longer term, depends on your time frame you're looking at, it's, or there are quite a few sectors that still look questionable in here. So I wouldn't get bullish as a general statement until and unless we see more and more sectors break out to the upside. For now, I would stay really cautious I wouldn't short the form, okay? Don't go crazy bearish, but there are a short, but there is a short or two, I think, that are worth considering, especially in healthcare and in software. And here's the deal as I often say, if I didn't have to take another short for the rest of my life, I'd be totally fine with it. But here's the good news, or here's the importance, I should say, of shorting it helps you to see both sides of the market. As I often say, my friends who are running tons and tons of money on long side only through their charters or however or loud they can only buy stocks they can't short them they always tend to be a little glass half full and never glass half empty now they're often right in being positive because there's often a positive bias longer terms in the market and an occasional 50 percent haircut as you know but for the most part they do they do well but sometimes I feel like they might be missing the potential downside in the market because they're not shorting. So I would recommend you learn how to short just so that you you see both upside opportunities and downside opportunities. And in learning to short, you'll also see things like you, you might be bullish on an area, bullish on a sector. But then you'll notice that, well, wait a minute, there's a bow tie down here or there's a first thrust down or some other sort of pattern. And it might help you to pull your horns in a little bit. Now, as an example, I'm starting to pull my horns in a little bit on the gold and silver stocks. Let's take a look at those real quick and then we'll open it up for, in fact, start asking now if you have some individual stocks you want to cover. So let's take a look. Let me just show you what I mean. So I'm, I'm still bullish on gold and silver, maybe because I'm long. But if we put in the bow ties here, it's like, well, wait a minute. These things are beginning to roll over. We could see a bow tie down here soon. So if I wasn't someone who actually shorts stocks, then I might not, I might be so bullish that I forget to notice their signals to the downside. Yeah, this is TSCO. This is one that we're short now. We're looking for a, an initial profit target of 90 and we're not quite there just yet. Now we're off the worst levels, but hey, we're not gonna watch the screen all day. All right, expel to the upside. All right, again, start asking about individual questions if you have any, individual stock, individual stocks, he's for me to say. Yeah, this one looks okay. Volume a little bit to the low side, as you can see roughly what, uh, a little bit less than 200,000 shares on average. So a little bit on the thin side, I'd be careful because of that. It's fairly volatile, HV is about 90, but I hear you, Mike, it's not a bad looking stock. It's kind of taken off in here, it has a bit of a knockout move. It's kind of interesting though, this knockout move is kind of like all the way back to this little peak, but it looks okay. So far it's begun to rally out of the knockout move. I wouldn't take it as a new setup in and of itself. If you're long, I would stay long. You guys hear those cicadas? All right, any more? Well, while we're on impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Again, no show next week. I'm going to be moving. 
The week after that, I will likely resume the show, God willing. And also the week after that, I'll start my show over at StockCharts.com. So I would encourage you to check that out too. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a great weekend. And I look forward to seeing you guys again in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.